We'll begin by acknowledging that we are on the unceded um, traditional ter territories of the Coast Salish people, specifically the Squamish, the Musqueam, and the Tsleil-Waututh. Um, and my name is Melanie O'Brien. I'm the director of SFU Galleries, for those of you that don't know me. And um, we're going to have a series of introductions. So I'm going to speak first um, a little bit about how this project came to be and what its meaning is for SFU Galleries. And I'll be followed by Elspeth Pratt, the director of the School for the Contemporary Arts. Um, so from our perspective, the works and events and performances and installations and pedagogical activities has within the Wide Reaching Landmarks um, 2017 program actively take up critical questions of our moment around land, uh, colonialism, and ongoing cultural, environmental, and climatic crises. And we're really happy to co-present tonight's event with the School for Contemporary Arts. Um, Amy Kazimierczuk, Odin curator, um, initiated this event to really coalesce a conversation around those recent activities that are connected to activities in this building, both what we've been doing, what the school's been doing, and then this wider um, discussion to create a public forum for, for, for this discussion. And so Amy will be moderating the conversation um, after this. Um, so in the last couple of years, SFU Gallery's programming has really been focused on investigating place and delving into questions around land and its use. And granted, the term land use, of course, is a colonial term. Um, uh, so at the heart of this investigation are artistic practices, um, artists, writers, and thinkers that are grounded in cultural, material, experiential, and pedagogical relationships to land. And so I just wanted to list a couple of examples of things that we've been doing because it connects to some of our speakers tonight. Um, for example, in 2016, we presented an exhibition called Unsettled, curated by Tara Hogue, and that included the work of Tanya Willard, amongst other artists, um, that examined complex entanglements of belonging and refusal from both settler and indigenous perspectives, and really was particularly examining the, the site of SFU Gallery um, on Burnaby Mountain. Um, and so Tanya, Amy will introduce her practice or a little bit later, uh, but of course is committed to those, these kinds of questions in her artistic and curatorial practice. And Tanya was also part of this intertextual um, art and dialogue reading group that was held across institutions in 2016 um, that was really set up to critique and support a community based in text, uh, recognizing the process of selection and contaminant uh, erasure. Um, that occurs in any process of representation, particularly of indigenous practices in non-indigenous institutions and by non-indigenous individuals. Um, and Janine Frina Julie's work, which we also included in a recent program, um, our four-part exhibition series, Geometry of Knowing, that was held between um, all of SFU galleries, um, explores present-day ideas of tradition, performativity, race, and gender, while questioning the continual construction of of culture and its relationship to land. And in addition, in the past couple of years, we've brought speakers like Lucy Lepard um, to speak in this room to questions of mining, politics, art, and land in the West. Um, we've presented the exhibition Maps and Dreams, co-curated by Brian Youngen, which looked at land use in the Treaty 8 territory of BC. Um, we've presented work by American uh, uh, artist Amy Siegel, the work called, entitled Quarry, which looks at marble mining and then how that marble is, is transformed into a luxury commodity, particularly in Manhattan high rises and their showrooms. Um, and we've also commissioned a video by German artist Andreas Bunta entitled Erosion, which also thought about um, uh, SFU's Burnaby campus as a geologic deposit and take sort of the long view or the Anthropocene scenic view of land use. Um, and of course, we've always been happy to work with the faculty and students in the SEA and uh, really shared Sabina's commitment in particular to these questions. So seeing land use as a defining question of our moment and the history from which this country was created and of course is troubled um, by this 150th celebration, um, our work at SFU Galleries, in collaboration with numerous other organizations and groups, is to support an in-depth consideration through art and its attendant discussions on how land and its intersection with human use is articulated, represented, and contested. So whether that's oil and gas, mining, forestry, fishing, agriculture, or other development, our local region and our larger context is made up of distinct and threatened cultural, geopolitical, and ecological zones to which I think we owe a great deal of attention uh, from this vantage point. So I'll ask Elsabeth to come up next. 
Um, well, I want to start um, by thanking Amy Kazmierczak and SFU Galleries for acknowledging the need to build on the work done around the landmark initiative and recognizing that it begs for further conversation and to especially thank Amy um, for actually for doing all the work. <laughs> um, in October, in, just to give you a sense of what was accomplished in quite a short time, um, in October 2015 was when I heard, first heard about the project and it was um, brought, at that, at that point it was called Art Tracks 150. And it, the idea was brought to the Fine Arts Conference and by um, Vladimir um, Spiknovic. And he wanted the universities across Canada to become involved. And at the point, 16 of us volunteered um, to offer a course in spring 2017. And it would culminate in an insta installation of work in a national park. In conjunction with this project, at that time, they were in the process of hiring the curators. And they ended up hiring um, seven curators. And tonight, we're very fortunate that Tanya Willard, who um, was one of the um, curators, is here, has join is joining us. And um, the curators invited 12 artists, of which also we're fortunate to have Janine Frey Julie and our faculty member, Jin Mi Yoon. Once the, the, once the curators came on board, the project was immediately renamed Landmarks 2017. There were many partners and donors, but without the support from Partners in Art, which is a char charitable um, volunteer-based group in Toronto, I don't believe much of this would have taken place. Landmarks was an extremely ambitious project um, that yielded an extensive collaboration and dialogue between educators, artists, and curators. I want to applaud um, Sabina Bitter and her students for taking on this challenge for the School for Contemporary Arts and Jinmi Yoon for her successful project, and, but also to thank her for how inclusive she was when launching her project so that our students played a role. We were very pleased that Tanya Willard and Janine Fain Julie are here tonight. As well, I understand that Janine did meet with our students back in February at an early point in the project. So congratulations to all that were involved and for your outstanding work, and I look forward to the conversation tonight. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for coming tonight. I'm not going to say too much more. I think I just had to scratch out all of my comments after this two women spoke. But I just wanted to say that I partly wanted to put on this event because a lot, all of the women speaking tonight are um, artists that I get to engage with on a regular, frequent, long-term basis. And I got to hear a lot about the production and development, a lot of the artworks that they were making for Landmarks, and really also maybe get some context for how uh, these projects were in and of themselves their works. Um, outside of or without the landmarks frame around them. And I think that that's also really important. And that was part of why I think in a way, um, of course, we are acknowledging the significance of this pro um, this initiative and partners in art in helping to support it. But alternatively, I also wanted to basically give all of the artists who are speaking here today the space to speak on their own terms as artists and to frame the work how they want to outside of the particular conditions of the larger um, institutional framework. I also just want to acknowledge that concurrent to this event is a second event happening called A Subtle Revolution, What Lies Ahead for Indigenous Rights, marking the 10th anniversary of the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, which is happening downstairs right now. In case any of you guys are in the wrong room, it's on the second <laughs> floor, if that's what you were here for. Um, and we're going to be sharing a reception in the lobby with its participants and guests afterwards. So thank you to Amjo Hall in the SFU's Office for, of Community Engagement for co-sponsoring the reception. Reception. And I guess maybe part of also why I wanted to hold this event is that there's some, I think, some significant um, visions or claims of this project that I also really did want to talk about publicly. The proposition for Landmarks 2017 coincided with the anniversary of 150 years of Canadian Confederation. And Partners in Art put forward I, what I thought was quite an ambitious call to artists and curators to consider legacies of colonialism, the complex relationship between nationhood and cultural identity, as well as our relationship to nature in the face of present day environmental and climatic crises. It's a pretty big load to bear. Um, they also envisioned that Landmarks 2017 would create a forum for collaboration, knowledge, sharing, negotiation of differing perspectives, indigenous methodologies, and the creation of new frameworks frameworks of understanding through a coordinated art curriculum in universities. Now to take all that on, we'd be here for probably, I don't know, eight months probably, but we have two hours. So I do hope that uh, in our conversation tonight, we are at least get to talk 
a little bit about the complexity of attending to these values and goals within the context and conditions of the project's framework and timing. So uh, I'm not going to introduce the artists independently. I'm going to let them introduce themselves as they wish. Uh, but I will let you know that the order of speakers is going to be Tanya Willard, Janine Frey Jutley, Jin Mi Yoon, and then Sabina Bitter with her students um, that Three of the students that participated in the landmarks, uh, the Laboratory Landscapes course, uh, Sophie Vanden Bigelar, Roxanne Charles, and Crystal Coughlin. And I don't, are you guys going to read out the names of all the other students that were part of the project too? Oh, super. So I'll let them do that. But thank you for joining us. Great. Thank you, everybody, for being here and joining. Um, this is my first chance to really talk about the project since um, production, so this is really a great uh, thing for me to reflect. I'm going to put a timer on because I do want uh, us, us to have some time for um, discussion. Uh, it will be my first time, I think, seeing some images from the uh, SFU uh, program, so I'm really looking forward to your presentations. Uh, I'm just going to set myself up here. So I am, uh, thank you so much, uh, Amy, for, uh, and previous speakers for laying out a bit of the background of Partners in Art. So I came in uh, as a curator with an ambitious national project with all these variable dimensions. I did work very closely with the team of curators, uh, Veronique LeBlanc, uh, Kathleen Ritter, Ariella Polk, Melinda Spooner, David Davini. Um, oh my gosh, am I forgetting anyone? Am I forgetting anyone? That's most of us. Um, <laughs> and, uh, but I'm not going to speak to our collective uh, process. Sorry, am I having any image up? Oh, um, okay, well, uh, I have images, but <laughs> they may be in some other format. Uh, but I'm not going to speak to the overall curatorial um, process uh, as a collective. Um, because this is a chance where I can talk about what even drew me to the project in the first place, um, which uh, is different than arriving at a place of collaboration with the curators, which was important to, uh, to me and to the development of the project. But this is a chance where I can tell you a bit about um, how I saw the four projects I worked in uh, work together. Uh, are we going to do some things? <laughs> We may watch Netflix instead. No, just joking. <laughs> um, I do have a few images uh, starting out with site visits. So early on, when we went into the interviews, we were asked to pitch five artists we would consider working with uh, initially. Oh, sorry. OK. And then this is a great image, so I wanted to make sure you'd be able to see it. Um, these are from site visits. So once we arrived at approval of the artists and collaboration and many, um, many discussions, a few uh, rare in-person meetings of all the curators in uh, Toronto, uh, we then embarked on a process with the artists for them to vision the work. Uh, and for me, I've been working with, um, with an interest in developing a curatorial strategy that starts with honoring indigenous territories. And that in some ways comes from my own experience moving back home to my home reserve, uh, Nisqanlis uh, Indian Band community, uh, and what that has meant for me in terms of my journey as an artist and a curator. And so also with my background uh, in community engaged indigenous politics, it was interesting for me to start to think about ways where um, the land itself could be uh, uh, cited as part of the work in some way. And so what drew me to the Partners in Art project was this license to be able to work in national parks uh, and work with artists with a, with a decent um, amount of infrastructure and budget to support that and to be able to work with artists uh, in their home communities and in different kinds of contexts. And so I will walk you through several of the projects um, I have worked in. I'm not going to spend too long in the detail of each of them because we don't have enough time and I worked with four different projects and we have Janine uh, who will talk directly about her project so I'm just only going to introduce it. Uh, so this first image is uh, artist uh, Maureen Grubin. Uh, she's a Nuvialuit artist based in Victoria from the community of Tuk Tayak Tuk. And this is an image uh, as part of the site visits. Um, uh, Maureen Grubin actually uh, in her home community she lives uh, when she's there in the summers at a place where you can see these uh, what are called uh, pingos. 
And uh, after we had changed the name, you heard the name was originally Art Tracks. I think Art Tracks won 50 at times. And after we summarily decided we were going to rename that as curators to be able to kind of work uh, with the critical ideas we were looking at, uh, we um, we named it Landmarks, and then in the process of actually arranging a visit to Janine's uh, community in uh, Old Crow, uh, I was talking with Maureen Grubin, who was back home in Tuk Tuk Tuk, and she was sending these fantastic images of work she was doing there. And so I, on a whim, went like, oh, I wonder if there's what national parks are kind of near her, near Tuk Tuk Tuk. And it turned out there was uh, the only one designated, designated Canadian landmark uh, pingo. Uh, which are ice cored hills that rise out of the Beaufort Sea. And uh, anyway, that's the backstory of uh, at one point the government designated landmarks, but one was only one was ever designated, and that's the Pingos. And we're at the top of Ibiak Pingo, so they have names. Uh, they're about a thousand years old. They're a solid core ice, uh, and they rise out as these um, mountains out of the sea. Sorry, that actually is out of order. I'll speak to those in a moment. I'm going to skip ahead quickly. Ooh, you get to see everything, and then I'll go backwards. OK, yeah, here we go. Site visits still. So this is uh, myself, uh, Kira Kardowski, who worked as Maureen Grubin's artist assistant, worked with her very closely in developing the project and supporting her, and uh, Maureen's older sister. And we're, cl we're cleaning uh, beluga whale intestines in the sea. And that, for me, was a really important part and formative in terms of my curatorial work. And this is my sort of what I've been trying to get at in my work the last few years is this place where, um, where I can cite the experience of that uh, in some way in the development of the work. Uh, and she was making, she was experimenting with uh, the beluga whale intestine as a material. So um, people have made things like, uh, uh, you may have heard of seal floats or different techniques where people use the intestine for different materials. And she was experimenting with this as an artistic uh, practice material. So here is Maureen with her final work, uh, which was titled Stitching My Landscape. It's the first large-scale work of land art that this artist has embarked on. Um, the core visual elements you'll see here are this uh, red broadcloth. This is the final installation of the work. It stretches, um, we go here. It's 111 ice holes drilled with her father's um, traditional ice hole drill uh, and stitched together with this red broadcloth. Um, it's over a thousand feet and it was installed April 23rd, 2017 uh, on an expanse of the frozen ocean surrounding Ibiak Pingo, so one of the Ca Canadian national landmarks. Uh, so she prepared over 300 meters of broadcloth in a labor intensive method that involved splitting it in half uh, and then hand rolling it into these large uh, balls. So this is her on the ice with the installation. This is some of the material as she's preparing it. Um, so this sort of uh, laborious work, and then these are drone images. So she does have a final video work that you can see on the Landmarks website. We're not going to screen it tonight. Um, in part, she's not here, um, and it is available online. We have only so much time to see uh, the works, but extraordinary video work that, uh, that traces uh, the final installation. Uh, the background audio in the film, if you do have a chance to see it online, is the sound of the chisel that belonged to Maureen Grubin's father working the ice. Uh, and the, the final installation also echoes the use of delta trim pattern uh, and other um, traditional sewing and textile techniques um, that she then layered on the landscape. And she thinks of the work as really contributing uh, to a sense of healing. And Abiak Pingo has a special relationship for her um, she uh, went there many years ago and stayed overnight with a friend, and it has a special relationship to her, and also layers of traditional uh, Inuvialuit storying. Sorry. I like checked the order and then I messed it all up. So perhaps we'll briefly touch on this project. Um, this is Bellevue House National Historic Site. Now this was not an artist commissioned project. Uh, this was meant to be an extension of Cheryl LaRondelle and Camille Turner's project. Um, and, oh, I don't know what happened. Oh, there, okay. Uh, and uh, it didn't work out that way because we quite reali we realized quite early that this was ambitious for the artists to be asked to do all these things, community engagement, thinking about these issues, dialoguing, and I quickly didn't even ask them about this project. I was like, that's a terrible thing to do to the artists. So I ended up uh, curating from a collection, um, but, 
it's important because it extends the idea of intervention that was coming from Camille Turner and Cheryl Laurendel's project. This is a work by Melissa General. She's a Mohawk artist uh, installed here. Uh, this is the one story I want to tell about this work. So um, this was just a large white triangle at the front of the visitor center. When we proposed the work, I wanted to get out in advance of the National Historic Site, which is John A. MacDonald's summer home and has a whole history of confederation. We were trying to show contemporary indigenous practice and some criticality here. Um, but they didn't tell me in the landscaping plan that I was sent about this large <laughs> cut letters. So in this documentation image, I've sliced it away. Uh, and this is the context of what's so beautiful about this project uh, as it, it comes down October 7th is, uh, is that the uh, flower arrangements have now totally taken over those uh, metal plasma cut letters. <laughs> Uh, and they dress in a historic dress and have this whole conversation. That's important because uh, the artists, Camille Turner and Cheryl Laurendel, sorry for this jumping around, uh, their project was very much informed by a boat tour in the Thousand Islands. And that's how I want to start theirs. Uh, and in those boat tours, there are uh, uh, sort of canned tourist history, brief overview of Canadian history that really emphasize a dominant narrative. Uh, they have a faux, that's 10 minutes. <laughs> they have a faux um, John A. McDonald accent. They're really ingrained in that. And so uh, Camille and Cheryl chartered a boat and gave their own crews. Uh, Cheryl Rondell is a media and community engaged artist who works from Cree uh, worldview. And Camille Turner is a Toronto-based, uh, Jamaican-born Canadian artist working from African diasporic views. And together, they invited, this is Jan Hill from Tyendinaga Mohawk, and they asserted both uh, a graciousness to their hosts in this territory, as well as programming uh, their own performance work aboard, so this is about 200 people cruising on the Thousand Islands um, in uh, relationship to Thousand Islands National Park. Uh, there's many detailed stories here. We weren't actually allowed to dock on land in the park, so we decided to just be completely watercraft. Uh, this is Eddie Robinson. So they invited a number of artists to talk through and perform and give an entirely new um, tour on this, uh, on this occasion. We ended with the round dance. Uh, this is another element of their project. Uh, this whole project is called Freedom Tours. You will be able to see the final uh, video and audio of the tour um, in the next month online. This is another element of their project where they worked with local school districts and created uh, these large banners as well as hashtag flags that people carried with them uh, on a journey through Rouge National Park, which is the first uh, urban national park. So you can see here a very wide picture of the different art, the way different way artists were working, the challenges uh, we faced, and what kinds of uh, commissions and engagements happened through the project. And I guess probably that shifting through those images is probably my experience curatorially of what this whole project was like. So. <laughs> I'm catching up to myself. Uh, this I'm going to quickly um, move through, and we're going to Janine's going to follow and show her project. We're very excited to see the film in this nice uh, setting. Uh, but I did want to speak that what I spoke of in terms of the process with Maureen Grubin's work uh, was also really important in the way I approached Janine's work, and I had the honor of visiting her home community and working with her closely in the development of her project. Uh, and she'll, you'll see her film, and it'll inform uh, some of your thinking about what she's doing, and we'll hear from her later. But this is an image we were able to share some time uh, in New York at the American Museum of Natural History, and we were looking at historic dog blankets from the Mackenzie River Delta area, I believe. Uh, and this is an image of that process, so that I also echoed uh, people in this, the artists in the space of some of the research and development and community engagement at times of the work, and that was a real privilege and honor um, to be there. This is uh, Janine's film screening in Mississauga uh, at this great outdoor screening. And that's an image of one of her final works, which she'll talk about. They're ski dog blankets, and some were gifted to community. And this is an installation image, and now you'll get to see some of the action in terms of the ski dog blankets out on the land in this beautiful dance and movement that celebrates many, uh, many of the protocols, traditions, values, and ways of working in exciting ways that Janine has shown in her film, Being Skidoo. So thank you. Sorry, it's a lot to talk about on this project. So I tried to fit it in. <laughs> now let's watch Janine's beautiful work. <laughs> thank you, Cook's Jam. <laughs> hey. Um, 
Hi, my name is Janine Freyna-Jutley, and uh, yeah, I'm really grateful to get to be here today, to have gotten to have the opportunity to do a community-based project in my traditional territory in Old Crow, Yukon, and to also get to be able to, like, I haven't seen it projected before. And we're going to get to share, like, we're going to get to witness that and, like, share that first experience together and to hear it in, like, this amazing surround sound. I'm, like, I'm really looking forward to that. Um, but, yeah, I just, uh, I feel like I could spend my whole speaking time just saying thank yous and just to, there's so many people that have touched this project and have helped enable this work to be. And uh, I just feel uh, really grateful for the, the support that I've had in getting to make uh, this getting to make this video work. I call it an experimental documentary on the process of making these uh, ski dog blankets. Um, so, and I actually had this idea, I wanted to do this, uh, and I was doing a residency at the Banff Center in 2013, and I was like trying to go to Parks Canada in Banff and like fit, uh, fit their skidoos and like tailor garments for them essentially. And then, I, but I wasn't able to, it just wasn't right. And then I had the opportunity and Tanya approached me and now like to get to realize this in my home community with my family, like my dad helped so much in the process of making this film. And so did, um, so did my brother, so did my nephew, so did my cousins. Like it, it was just really um, amazing to get to, I feel like it's kind of in my dream. Like since I, learned about community-based projects. I've always wanted to do something in Old Crow, so it was really great to get to do that and like buy sewing machines for the community and like do skill sharing and get to, um, yeah, just uh, gift and share and think more deeply about, uh, about land use and about um, our movements and gestures on the land. Um, and then also thinking through um, having sovereignty over, over our images, over images of how our land is depicted, how images of the North are consumed, and how they're often used to perpetuate these ideas of Canadian nationhood that aren't really reflexive of me um, or our, our community's relationship to land and land use. Um, so the Ski Dog Blanket came out of this tradition that the Gwich'in people have of making, uh, making garments, making regalia for our dogs. And that's our way of honoring, of honoring them, of honoring our interdependent relationship with them that enables us um, and has always like, enabled us to live traditionally on the land um, and navigate the landscape. And so with these ski dog blankets, uh, the skidoo when it first came out, a little anecdote, is that it was initially supposed to be called the ski dog. Um, and then through marketing got called the ski do. And um, by doing that, it kind of erases that history and presence and relationship that indigenous people in the far north have to land. And I wanted to presence that relationship by creating these ski dog blankets um, and still honoring our transportation. Um, and for me, the work the work exists in two places, and one is up north in Old Crow among like family, elders, community members that these Skidoo blankets were gifted to and made for, made with, and um, they're, they're actually a technology as well because the ski dog blanket covers the hood of the Skidoo and it actually helps um, protect the air intake from getting cold air into it, which forms water, which can like corrode through when it goes through the gas system. So it can actually corrode your, so it helps uh, prevent against engine corrosion, which is like a fun, or it's just, it's nice that it's also very, very practical and helps keep the skidoos warm. And a lot of, um, a lot of people were excited about that and just getting to like custom. I made one with my friend, Sophie, and it's like camo and it has Cho written on the front of it, which means like big. And she's like this really tall, like, badass Gwich'in woman who's like 24 and owns her own skidoo in Walton. And anyway, it was just really fun to get to like collaborate with people and youth and friends and stuff on these. But yeah, if we could show the film, it'd be great. Thanks. Um, likewise, um, like Janine, I feel uh, Really, it's an opportunity to give thanks um, because uh, you know I, I made the project, and then we had a, a launch at 
Pacific Rim National Park Reserve where my project was. And really, there hasn't been anything, really. So this is kind of wonderful that you've gathered here and that I can um, screen the, the video. And I also have some postcards that I'd like to gift you. If you like them, I have them up front. So please, um, uh, I'd be happy if you would uh, like to have one. Um, it, it's a real privilege. Uh, it, it was a daunting project in a way. It's uh, one of the most difficult I've ever worked on. Uh, lots of different layers of logistics, um, but uh, it was so rewarding. And one of the reasons when Kathleen Ritter, um, whom I wish to thank, who was a curator for my project, asked me about doing this, uh, kind of critically looking at Canada 150 and uh, selecting uh, any uh, national uh, park, I decided to do it partly because uh, I was thinking about the difference between um, my project, uh, well, 26 years later after Souvenirs of the Self, uh, which was uh, cited at, at our oldest um, national park, which was uh, um, set up in 1885. Um, so it, it's been quite a journey, and I'm excited to, like Janine, to see it large and also uh, with surround sound. Um, but I would like to thank uh, Amy and Melanie and Elspeth and my colleagues, Sabina and the students. It's a very rich, congenial uh, atmosphere uh, to work in, uh, to look at these kind of critical questions about what we are exactly celebrating in terms of Canada 150, in terms of uh, our, our particular moment in history. And there are really too many people to thank, but because it's the, the first time I've been able to really publicly uh, in, in this way, uh, to have uh, a more formal situation, I would like to thank um, uh, my parents. Um, my mom couldn't be here, but my father's here, Young Jun Yoon, and um, my my siblings um, and my my kids, uh, Kian and Hanum. Uh, they're not here because they're respectively uh, in uh, Victoria and Seoul studying. So. Um, my family was a part of uh, this work, and uh, it is an exploration of kind of thinking about what it means to be a diasporic subject on the edges of the Pacific Rim, thinking about our entangled histories uh, of place history uh, in terms of militarism and colonialism in particular. Um, and uh, so uh, it was an opportunity to work together. My sister, Chin San Yoon, uh, did helped with the community engagement. She works with a lot of indigenous uh, communities um, and she teaches at UVic and uh, she was instrumental in helping me kind of work through um, understanding uh, indigenous protocol and also she had uh, worked with New Channel peoples before um, in, a, in community uh, uh, settings. And um, I learned so much from listening to uh, what people had to say about place. I am really uh, have so much gratitude to uh, uh, Vi and Bob Monday, who are uh, Yukulit um, elders, and Geneva Tushi, who is a Yukulit First Nation member of legislature, and Joe Martin, Talakot, a uh, First Nations elder, and Terry Dorland and Tammy Dorland, and they're um, a part of the tribal uh, parks coordinators for the Talokwat, and Ellen Kimoto, who was a Japanese-Canadian activist uh, whose family was interned, um, and then she eventually did uh, go back to Yukulit, and John Bishop, who was a Korean War veteran, uh, he was a home child, and Art Lefebvre, who was a Korean War veteran as well, and he was Métis. Um, so in listening to the stories, um, they don't figure directly uh, in the work, but they're in the work for sure. So it's wonderful for me to acknowledge um, uh, the kind of time and uh, experience and knowledge that they sh freely shared with me. I had a whole PowerPoint about the kind of historical relations, but everybody's been so like really good about staying on time. So I'm not going to show that. I'll just say a few words um, uh, about the site and uh, say that it's, uh, it's, it's really the site that I picked because um, there's so many interwoven entangled histories and uh, there's still continuing struggles, of course, in terms of land with, uh, with the Yukulit and the Talokwat uh, that are actually within the park. The reserves are in the park 
um, grounds. Uh, and uh, uh, the Yukulit are treated and the Talakwat are not. And so there's lots of uh, uh, um, still very contentious issues that are within the park grounds in terms of indigenous peoples and their continual struggles. And there's also intense military history, uh, World War training grounds, uh, preparing the Canadian Armed Forces for the Japanese invasion that never happened. Um, uh, of course, the Japanese Canadians, as I said, were forcibly removed and interned after Pearl Harbor and all their fishing boats, and there were 3,000 family along, families along that coast. And there's also the Kapyong Memorial, which is, um, was erected to commemorate uh, the battle in which Canadians um, served in the Korean War in a particularly uh, brutal um, standoff. Um, and the Korean War and the Cold War, uh, there uh, Cold War ruins, the Radar Hill, which was uh, ostensibly built after the Korean War because of um, the fear about uh, the, uh, the Russians uh, right along the west coast of Canada and down to the States and across, um, yeah, the t Pine Tree Offensive going across Canada. So all this is almost invisible other than some signs if you're paying attention that there are still unexploded devices to watch out for. Uh, but, of course, if you're looking um, with a different way of uh, understanding um, how uh, uh, the spectrally the land and the sea, everything is uh, haunted by these histories. And then beyond the kind of human histories, uh, there's just this incredible force of everything that swirls and is, in, is present uh, within and, and beyond us. So I was so taken aback by the kind of en energetic forces that I could feel there um, and the kind of haunted, uh, uh, hauntedness of, of, um, of uh, all those specters that I was speaking of. So, and then I do have the postcards um, uh, here and you can look at them. Um, they're, they, uh, they are very different uh, in relation to thinking about land. I think if, if souvenirs of the self thought about um, kind of settler nationalism, what we now think of nationalism in relation to, um, you know, uh, thinking about Canada and how um, the idea of wilderness was so, so, so uh, important in terms of narrating this place as uh, uninhabited when we know that's not true in relation to indigenous peoples uh, and also other kinds of histories, uh, um, let's say, of the, uh, of the Pacific um, National Railway coming through, then we know that, uh, you know, that again, um, uh, that uh, there's a kind of, the terms of inclusion are what we're questioning. But in this project, it, it's really about kind of thinking about uh, how self and other are constituted, but also in terms of thinking about extended temporalities, um, how, about the long view and how the temp time is also nested, that uh, uh, different periods coexist. And also in terms of certain kinds of subjectivities, like diasporic subjectivities, they're spatially simultaneous, so you can be there and here at the same time. And then just to end off, I'd like to um, thank uh, wonderful people that were actually helped me realize the project. And I see that Rachel Topham is here. Thank you, Rachel. Uh, she was a photographer for the uh, postcards and also uh, the second camera for the video. And also I'd like to acknowledge Judith Steedman, who is of Steedman Designs, who uh, designed the postcards with me. And um, Ian Barber, who is remarkable. He was first camera and sound and editing for my project. I love working with Ian. Uh, he's like air. He's absolutely necessary, but so um, so uh, gentle and, uh, and, and incredibly talented. And also um, uh, Cheo Kang, who finished in our film program, and Pyong Song Lee, who's still in our program, and Rachel Stableford uh, for helping with production and a former uh, grad student, Jeff Jeffrey Langil, and our current grad student, Arena Lord, for a project and production assistance as well. And I just wanna say the experimental camera work with the shaking and the kind of montage sequences and also the audio 
um, I'm really excited by, and that's some, something that I've been doing kind of for a while, and now I get to share some of that with you. So that camera work is my camera work, and it's layered um, with uh, Ian's help with uh, archival images. And uh, so I hope you enjoy. Uh, thank you very much, uh, and thank you all for coming out, especially I see some of my dear friends in the audience, and also to my family. Thank you. It's really fantastic to see all these works on the very big screen. And our works were not done for the big screen. They are rather pixelated, I think. OK. Um, first of all, uh, also thank you uh, to Amy for putting this up, setting, uh, putting all this together, and to Melanie. But also I want to thank uh, Elspeth and the School for the Contemporary Arts that I actually had the possibility to develop a course like this in this very experimental way. So um, I'm sticking to my, my notes. When I was invited to design the course within this Landmarks project, um, I considered this to be an exciting, an exciting opportunity to also uh, stretch the understanding of a university course in general, usually to deliver knowledge or to teach what we know or what we better should know. I intended the class to become more of a collective learning experience for everybody involved in this class. So we also, during the course, we uh, put more and more material onto our uh, website here. To call it laboratory landscapes, suggested research, experiment, unexpected encounters, and unknown results. Topics of the course were landscape, nature, and indigenous and colonial histories or colonialism, Eco ecological context, the Anthropocene or the Capitalocene, and the social function of landscape and of parks. Here we were in a field trip in uq -Led. So first of all, when the course started, I decided to move the project from the big forest site, uh, like the National Park in the Pacific Rim, where usually these projects would, would happen, to the urban Stanley Park. And this was not so much only for convenience, but rather that Stanley Park somehow has embedded and represents all of the topics we wanted to address in the course. And this was the only possibility uh, also right at this moment to thank um, the people from the parks board, Marie Lopez, uh, Chil Weaving, and Reina Soutour. Without them, it would not be, have been possible to uh, do this project. Here is the artist C. Weiss, uh, who shared histories and stories in the park with us. And laboratory is also meant to question the hierarchies of learning and to become a site of unlearning. How to break up or challenge our preconceptions of nature and the city, of land and resource, but also in our case in terms of what landmarks expect or our public art making and the notion of site specificity. So the course was also meant to be a step in unlearning colonizing practices. It was important to not see the complexities in approaching Stanley Park or problematics of that. Uh, Stanley Park as a site for an exhibition as a limitation, but to make the process, the negotiations and all the discussions of working in a site where indigenous protocols and colonial structures collide make this into a very productive framework for our projects. So the challenges of working in an area with a complex and contested governance, amazingly at the end resulted in a series of very precise and very thoughtful public art projects. Here, Selena Couture, after a seminar we had with her, we learned also about the conflicting colonial histories of the park, also here the background of Lord Stanley's statue. We visited further also the Ecology Society and learned about the ecosystem of the park. Uh, one of the early assignments in the class at the beginning was called Colonial Site, where each student identified a site within the everyday, on the way to school or on the way to work. Colonialism, not as somewhere in history, but a presence in our everyday lives. We embraced also there Mi Won Kwan's definition that a site might be more than just a location. 
And the colonial site project followed us through different stages. It became a participatory work where the audience could register uh, a site on a map and also in a book, which I brought here. It's dark green with gold lettering, uh, the colonial sites project. You can take a look. <laughs> And um, the shift from nature as resource to nature as resource for consumption, as also a backdrop of lifestyle activities, wellness, and social production, was the theme of some projects. A picnic in the park was one, and a series of motivational posters for people to engage in was another one. Here is on the seawall, and I point out only the one of the project with a background anecdote. In 1938, uh, fragrant water lilies were introduced to Beaver Lake, which is in the park, in celebration of the Dutch Queen Wilhelmina of her 40th Jubilee. Beautifying the lake, the lilies were and are invasive to the ecosystem. Due to the increased biomass decay, the lake shrank by 30% until the late 90s and will completely disappear in 2020, according to Stanley Park Ecological Action Plan. So uh, the gestures mimic the lilies in the, in, in the lake and they pose in front of the beaver lake. So interesting relation, relation we discussed, the relation of beauty and its uh, destructive force. The notion of a changing idea of what we perceive as natural and how we treat animals, for example, for this project, the former polar bear pit provided a perfect location it was called Bear Garden, which addressed the site as a ruin. Here you see an image in the polar bear pit. The student was referencing the lighting in a historical painting and the light box you saw before as an image in the image, kind of mise en boom, confronts the viewer with the production of a spectacular. So the student mimicked the lighting of this historic painting in the polar bear pit ruin. And in the class with a lot of research and background information, many students came back to the question of how they individually relate to the park. How to address oneself in relation to the park. This is where it started as a title. Realize this relationship in the form of celebratory banners with texts like, I saw it differently then, or I was taught the wrong story, or I was um, under the impression things were great. There were 12 different locations and they all made different sense to different people. One of, I think, the very effective works in the park was entitled Let Me In. Lord Stanley, who we already learned a lot in class before, was in this project holding his own cover, veil, or curtain with a text about belonging. And students were really busy during these two days of the exhibition discussing the work with partially very confused tourists. And it was also another kind of learning experience, even teaching experience. And understanding laboratory landscape is part of a larger decolonizing project. This is one of the works where students intervened in the perception and reading of colonial histories, also as a politics of perception. And at this point, I will hand over to Sophie, one of the students, uh, who made her work hollow. And then there's going to talk Crystal and Roxanne. Thanks. Hi. So yeah, I did the work hollow with Carly and Andy. and. We found that the hollow tree encompassed many of the themes that our group was specifically interested in. Um, the tree itself has been captured in early archival photos, has been knocked down by the 2006 windstorm, and suspiciously set on fire, which is inspiration for some of our video footage. Um, as well, it's been fundraised to become a monument and removed from the ecosystem in that way. Um, through the course, we learned about many of the things Sabine was talking about, and we had experiences that we probably wouldn't have had in the normal classroom setting. Um, when we were on Tofino, for example, we got the privilege of 
having Elder Joe speak to us and we learned specifically about why the trees are hollow um, at that stage in their life. The tree also was 700 to 800 years old when it died 100 years ago, so it was a way to think past the 150 of Confederate Canada. Um, we decided to, along with the projection, do a brochure, and that was a way for us to think about the institution of public art. Um, however, inside we included text that talked about wind as an artist forming the tree and the landscape, about the wind storm as a regulator um, and healer rather than a disaster. And that text was commissioned from the Stanley Park Ecological Society. Um, we have photos of the early archival photos, personal archives, news archives, and then the center photo of another hollow tree in Stanley Park that C. Weiss showed us as a way to sort of undermine the monumentalization of the hollow tree and decenter it without exploiting it further. Um, all of the brochures are on the top sections of the stairs, so please feel free to take one as well as the laboratory landscape pamphlet. Um, thank you. Hi, I'm Crystal. I worked on a project called the Canode Project. Our project was 150 plus hand-folded, handmade paper canoes. Each canoe had on one side notes that I had taken from the laboratory landscapes class where I was in a group that focused on indigenous knowledges. This is an example of one of our, um, one of our canoe notes. <clears throat> we focused on the canoe as a site that was movable and also as representing us coming together as a bunch of different people from different places working on a project together. So I would like to thank Roxanne and um, Rochelle over there who also helped me with this project. I see you guys. <laughs> thank you so much. Our project was a lot of labor. It took forever to make 150 canoes. I can't even stress how like, hard it is to make paper. So every time you see some handmade paper, take some time to appreciate it and for all that it's worth. So our canoe project started because we, um, <clears throat> we put forward a proposal to make a dugout canoe out of a felled log. This proposal didn't meet the time restraints that we had. They wanted us to remove the canoe after, and that would be impossible because it's a giant felled log. So we had to focus on making something that we could remove from the park, thus the small canoes. On one side of the canoe is a map, a map of all the logs that we could have potentially turned into a canoe. So essentially, this project is about a failed project. And that's the only way I can say as an artist to deal with a failed project is to make another project. That's the only way to do it. So that's what we did. <laughs> so with our canoes, we hung them up in the Stanley Park Nature House. The Stanley Park Nature House is a great resource for anybody to learn about anything that lives in the park. Animals that were brought in, plants that were brought in, and things that naturally occur in the park. So it, if you have time, this summer, go check it out. It's actually quite awesome. This is a picture of the installation at Indian Summer Festival with the canoes that we had left over. I believe there are still quite a few. And this is me teaching a group of students and people who pass by how to fold the canoes, which I cannot unlearn now forever and know how to make a canoe. Sorry, that is the end of my presentation. Thank you so much, especially to Sabina for having this class. And this class has brought together like professionals and emerging artists, and it was a great experience that I can't even stress. I hope we have this sort of class next year. Come on, come on guys. <laughs> Oops.
wrong way. Um, OCM Achalachasium Roxanne Sitsanatsium. My name is Roxanne Charles and I'm from Semiamu First Nation. Um, for those of you who don't know where that is, it's situated where the U.S. border is, where Blaine um, and the Surrey boundary are now. And um, first of all, I'd just like to say I was really interested in taking this course because it allowed me to get out of a classroom and engage in the landscape um, in a different way outside of this building and institution and also engage in um, the surrounding area, which is not my traditional territory, which I am a guest in. And so Stanley Park, I had my reservations right off of the bat on how I was going to engage in that. And we were in um, groups, so I kind of led organically. I'm not ever the one to step up and lead everybody. I kind of like to have discussions and allow things to take place organically. So I was a part of um, Crystal's group with the canoe, and I thought, well, canoe is a beautiful idea and a way to give back to the park in a way that's culturally relative and significant to the people whose land that it is, and it speaks to the history in a way which I found really interesting. So um, when I think about Stanley Park, these are the images um, that come, come to mind right away that you see this commodification of, of the park and of the land. And... Um, I chose this image because it's so strange. This is um, the Jesus question, depictions of Jesus in the Northwest Coast art. I should have had probably a picture of Lord Stanley, but I was just interested in how these images are co-opted and into these different narratives, so I included this. But I also want to acknowledge that a lot of the totem poles that we see here are not traditionally from these lands, and they're not Coast Salish um, markings, and that... Um, in the park, which what I would like Lord Stanley's image to be here um, to illustrate is that below him, as he stands there, you've seen him covered in the drapery. Below there is a statement that, the, that this park is made for all people of all colors to be welcomed in and to be utilized by. And the truth is about this park is that people were forcibly removed by gunpoint. And so for me, that's a heavy thing, and it's... Um, it's connected. I paddle with my Squamish canoe family in the Koholt through these waters here. And so for me, um, this process of not being allowed to gift or give something back in a culturally significant way was um, heavy for me to deal with, a heavy process. And I wasn't able to manufacture 150 canoes. I had a lot of um, resistance and um, I had to come about my own way of um, resolving that. And so um, for me, what ended up happening is um, there was a lot of questioning about how I had the right to weave in a space like that. And I felt um, I didn't have a desire to justify that through a process of written, systematic things that I felt very culturally disrespectful to provide to the three nations. I felt that it was a strange way to interact with my, my own family. And there's also just different, um, like I should say, my cousin Maureen Thomas is the chief of Tsleil-Waututh, but she's actually a Semiama woman who was displaced from her community through marrying um, a Tsleil-Waututh man. So there's a lot of underlying different things and cultural relations um, that are just not black and white and can't be dealt with through through this process. So. For me, I had an artist sit in in the park, and I was in there for um, two days. I smoked salmon at home. I had harvested um, invasive species, um, scotch broom, uh, Himalayan blackberry, uh, periwinkle, and English ivy from my own community is where I gathered them. And I decided to build this sculpture um, and this woman, kind of my female figure warrior, um, woman to address this, um, it's called silently suffocated. So the suffocation of indigenous voices through through this process that's, that's still here. Um, and so this is just the back of um, the sculpture. And um, that's just a detail of the material. So I just wanted to... Um, share that with you. We've each had our own unique encounters in the space, and that's mine. So, OCM.
on. I guess um, uh, we'll open it up to questions pretty quickly so that people can feel like they're participating. We actually have a good amount of time. It's nice. But uh, I, when Tanya and I were hanging out before this event started, she had said to me first what she reiterated at the podium was that it's so strange to have really kind of gone through quite a long journey, at least parallel to a number of other people, and to really not have a, had a moment to even talk to each other about it or reflect. So before I ask you anything, though I have a lot of questions, I'm just going to ask if any of you guys want to ask each other something and or just uh, respond or just maybe add something to what you said previously. I just think um, having a chance to just be here together is so nice. I really appreciate that because re there really hasn't been an opportunity to actually celebrate the moment. It's just been so rushed and we've been all working so hard and then it's so nice to actually come together with people who want to share that and with each other. It's really significant. I really appreciate it. Okay, then I will ask the first question. And I want to ask, I want to start um, by asking Tanya to talk a little bit more about her process of citation, but I want to I I actually start by um, reading out this list of national parks and historic sites that these projects were um, uh, enacted in. And if I was remiss of maybe not preparing one thing, it would maybe be a map of where all of them were located, just to get a sense of how broad they were. Um, but I'm going to name them for a reason because uh, it's based on the question. Pacific Rim National Park Reserve in BC, Vuntut National Park in the Yukon, Klondike National Historic Sites of Canada in the Yukon, Pingo Canadian Landmark in the Northwest Territories, Banff National Park in Alberta, Elk Island National Park in Alberta, Grasslands National Park in Saskatchewan, Riding Mountain National Park in Manitoba, Cape Mary, Prince of Wales <laughs> Fort National Historical Site, Pukasqua National Park in Ontario, Georgian Bay Islands National Park in Ontario, Rouge National Urban Park in Ontario, Thousand Islands National Park Ontario, Lachine Canal National Historic Site in Quebec, Mingan Archipel Archipelago National Park Reserve of Canada in Quebec, Fundy National Park in New Brunswick, Cape Breton Highlands National Park in Nova Scotia, and Gros Morne National Park in Newfoundland. And the reason why I want to say them is because what struck me when you were talking about citation as a form of um, both citing land but also uh, basically working through a, a, a process, I was thinking about what that meant in the initiation of the project to have to contend with these particular types of sites and their naming and the parameters and restrictions put on what were the types of sites that you were allowed to access and how those were already being framed and, and how your practice of citation maybe negotiated that or worked with that. I mean, can I see your list here? Yeah. Right. Um, so, yeah, I mean, when we went in, National Parks was already a partner on the project, uh, but, uh, when it came down to working in the parks, there's a number of considerations. So uh, it's very broad. That's why actually talking about it can be... Ch like, I didn't even touch on the uh, universities I worked with, which was Sheridan College, uh, OCAD University, and um, Queen's University. And there was this... It was great to hear from the student projects, but there was, there was such uh, amount of projects happening, uh, communities that were being engaged, student projects that uh, became actually quite impossible to actually cover and absorb and reflect on uh, all of those. But, you know, I would say with this list that I would also say um, Lokwit and New Channels territory, uh, Guachan territory, Tronda Huachan territory, Inuvialuit territory, uh, Stony uh, and Blackfoot territory, uh, Cree territories, uh, Mi'kmaq territories, uh, Beausoleil First Nation, uh, Akwesasne, Akwesasne, Tyandinaga Mohawk, and the many other nations there, um, the uh, Labrador areas, that, that all of these national parks, from, from my perspective, are all indigenous territories, whether people were actually moved out of those national parks or whether um, there was a subtler process of displacement. Uh, that, that For me, that was my starting point in considering them. And so that idea of citation is, is trying to look at 
those layers of history, but also on intimate experience and relationship and reciprocity with the land base. And it was tough also to work within the park system and the administration. You, you, in, you know, encountered it as well. And that doesn't mean that parks was not supportive and people weren't working hard. There's just so many layers um, to realizing things in these kinds of spaces and thinking through what these public spaces uh, are. And they're not places that are usually engaging with artists, and that's a challenge. You, there was, I think, for all of us, we were learning and teaching and doing all at the same time, concurrently. So when you were working with your artists, or you were talking through then what it was gonna mean to go into these places and to engage um, in these different types of bureaucracies and the terms, how were you, um, like, if you're thinking about like uh, practicing citation, mm -hmm. or how, what were some of the methodologies or the strategies or the kind of refusals that you guys talked about working with? If, I mean, you can talk about maybe one specific. To yeah, and then maybe I'm happy yeah. to pass it along. Um, but this idea of citation for me is a bit retroactive to the project. It was a way for me to think through the nation-specific context of uh, myself as a Sokotmuk person living within Sokotmuk territory and trying to um, uphold land title rights uh, histories uh, and struggles as well as aesthetics and kind of a um, look approaching history very differently and so citation is a way for me to talk about that embeddedness and relationship to land in a way that I hope other people can relate to because we have this academic term and familiarity with citing uh, and I love this idea in the academic context of building on layers of knowledge that has come before you and I really like to extend that to think through how that can um, relate to the, to the land itself. But that context is a process of my um, curatorial uh, lens and work and certainly not a process I would undertake uh, with this kind of um, level of administrative um, challenge and partnership. That's sort of my personal um, practice, what I get out of it as a curator. It's, it's not referring to the process of film permits, for example, in national parks. <laughs> Maybe you can share some of your... Um, as an undergraduate student, this was sort of the first time for me, and I know many of my classmates, talking with people like the Parks Board and institutions on actually realizing a work, and I'm just very thankful that we had that opportunity. Um, really all the site-specific visits and being able to go there was super important for the work and realizing um, the history of being there and the energies, as Jinmi was talking about, of the places. Um. I think that one moment was really interesting within the, uh, with, within the course, that at the beginning we had all this research and so much material, so much uh, facts and, and all this contested history and all this like, incredible indigenous history. And then so many of the students, which was all kind of new uh, knowledge, we also me didn't know so much about that. And then at one point there was a little bit, almost we got paralyzed. What can we do? It's just all too much. And then that moment when, uh, when it was always about like how do you, with your own history, with your own background and with your own knowledge, how do you build a relation to this site? And I think that was really the, 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 also the very interesting in discussions and how students really brought uh, out this very great engaging uh, works from an individual perspective. I think that's what I enjoyed most about um, the project was I had this fear and of, um, well, I just thought there was a weird silencing of indigenous voices and I, I totally understand why it is and it was out of respect for the three nations, but the project itself didn't allow for that respectful time to engage in that process in a respectful way. So part of me thought like you could throw up an inflatable penis and that would be less offensive than having someone weave or be in that space or, um, and it wasn't as, as if I was ever trying to be a voice for those nations, but just acknowledging the space. And I felt like a silencing that I wasn't able to do that. And so then I, I started to question, well, what gives other people authority to comment on this space more? And, and I had this fear of like, 
this disconnect from the space, coming in, popping up art for two days, and then walking out of there with like no repercussions or anything. And so I was really impressed by the thoughtfulness of each of the students and the collaborations and that there were common themes and conversations that came out in a very respectful way. Okay. <laughs> I, th I think this one works, yes. Um, for citations, I think what we did as a class is we really focused in the first, because the class ran from January till um, almost July, June. Um, we spent the first half really learning about the local knowledges, and that's really important, especially considering the truth and reconciliation calls. So learning about the knowledges, like the name Stanley Park actually doesn't um, give the park justice for the long history it has had for like over 10,000 years. So for this class, it was a lot about disrupting our own thoughts and how we felt in relation, like as being uninvited guests here and how we could make art out of how we feel. A quick note to the, to the name of Stanley Park, of course, that was one of the early projects where we said, okay, renaming, and then we find out there's already a renaming project going on. It's quite right. So we should call the park. That would be a, that maybe could be an overall class project. But then we found out that one language might not be the right thing to do in the park. It might still be better than call it Stanley Park, but still, it's so much more complicated. But that was an interesting moment, right? Um, <laughs> there, there's a lot to say, obviously, in engaging with place and in thinking through these projects, but I'm also curious, like, what this time period is going to be referred to later. And um, in conversations that I've been having with other artists, like they're in the in the wake of the truth and reconciliation. Um, and then in the wake and in Canada 150 right now, and then also like the pressure that's being put on Indigenous artists right now, um, institutional, um, and that there's like this institutional, um, I was talking with uh, Vanessa Kwan about this and that there's this like institutional buy-in that's happening and um, we know we saw something similar and by we I mean like I read about it because I was a BB but <laughs> um, <laughs> no no I just mean <laughs> like, <I'm sorry>. <laughs> <laughs> no just like in and you know um, James Luna is known for saying like call me in 93 Mm -hmm. Right, and that there's all this interest in 92 of showing mm -hmm. indigenous artists and having them be in all of the like large uh, national institutions. And then it's like, call me in 93. Like, what, what about next year? And like, how um, serious and invested are people in our voices and in our engagement with place and in their lasting relationship to place? Like, what does that look like? This is this has been like incredible. Like to get for myself to have this opportunity. It's definitely the largest project I've ever worked on. Like I can't. It's so hard to fathom. And then even like getting to sit here with all of you and get to watch this. And I'm just just feel like incredulous and so grateful. And Tanya, it's been such a pleasure to work with you. And um, yeah, but I'm just, th I'm curious about like what is the lasting relationship to place and like what will people's accountability be in the future? And it's like interesting and like politically correct now to have all of this weight and talk and conversations, but like what, what, what do the next, how does that affect the next 10 years, the next 50, the next whatever? And um, it's also just thinking about different relationships with time too and that there's like these really bizarre markers that even if you like completely don't want to engage with it, and I, uh, Tanya, I really appreciate how you talked about it in some of our initial conversations as being like, I'm not calling it an anniversary. I'm not calling it a celebration. Like it's an event and I will acknowledge it as an event that we're like forced to move through. And I know that there are some indigenous artists who've like refused any grants, any awards, anything that is tied to 150 money and uh, I respect those politics as well. And there's a lot of different strategies to make work and um, engage in communities around, around these times that kind of um, want to push us into sometimes like really strange and extractive boxes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let's see. 
I want to ask you a question um, specifically, Janine. I, I was just remembering today that um, I'm, I'm not going to be, you're going to have to say the specific name of the, the agreement, but that I think in just the months before you guys were um, completing your project, you went with a, a group of Gwich'in youth to Washington, D.C.? Yeah. Um, uh, and I'm gonna, maybe I'll just let you describe a little bit more about it, but it came up for me today in thinking about maybe some of the kind of goals or aims of this project within a certain uh, types of idealisms around um, reconciliation or decolonialization or, uh, and then thinking about the sort of the, the, the very real material land politics and uh, realities of economics and what the people in particular in your, in your community are up against. And I'm wondering um, if you can maybe just tell people what that, what that event was that you attended, but also how that registered for you in terms of the context of working on this project and how you approached it. I had it yeah, written down upstairs, yeah, the thank Arctic. You, thank you for that. Um, yeah, I was with the Arctic National, it's to, it's, I can speak for a very long time about it. And I've also been like trained to be able to speak for a length of time about it to senators, to staffers. And I'm um, in mentor, I'm being mentored right now by my godmother, Lorraine Nitro, who's been doing this advocacy work this political work for over 17 years to help protect the caribou herd's calving grounds. And um, every year, twice a year, Gwich'in, members of the Gwich'in Nation travel down to Washington to educate and to advocate for the permanent protection of the caribou herd's calving grounds. And uh, Vantat Park is unique in that it's part of the Vantat Gwich'in First Nations land claims agreement. And we're a self-governing nation, and that's part of what we can also do to protect the caribou herd's uh, migration route. And I have a huge amount to learn. Like, I'm not an expert in any way. Um, and I... <laughs> and I... Um, <laughs> it's like, check, you're not an expert. <laughs> um, yeah, and... It's, it's, I'm also learning that it's important for me to say that in those spaces. And, you know, I think that it's great how in your class you're thinking about, like, the hierarchies of knowledge or hierarchies of, like, these institutional spaces or of learning and that we're all, like, as Tanya said, we're all um, thinking, learning, doing, teaching simultaneously in this project. Um, so with the getting, getting asked to be able to do that, that kind of work for my community was just really... Um, just just an honor and um, we we need it it's I can it's really scary what's what's happening in policy in the states and I don't have to tell anyone that because you've probably all said that at some point yourselves among your pals or but um yeah to just to do that and think about land use and to think about also like what Buntut Park what Buntut Park means and it's like I when I went there, the person, like my, the parks guide was my auntie, you know, like it's just, it, it was so different up there. And a lot of the activities that happen with Parks Canada in Old Crow, they're all, they all happen within the community. They're not out in the specific park itself. And I remember um, starting to work on this project and talking to my dad and my brother and being like, I'm so excited to get to go to the park. Like I've always wanted to go. And then my dad's like, dear, we were there in the spring. Like we just didn't. You know, it's not like there's a gate that you go through or something, but we could like <laughs> boat it up there and went hunting, but it's not like there's some, you know, that brown sign with the beaver on it or whatever that says like, welcome, you know? Okay, it's green. I think anyway, yeah. <laughs> anyway, I'll um, pass the mic. I'd love to hear what you have to say, Jenny. Uh, uh, about, about your experience working in the park and... Oh, um, uh, well, it was, it was uh, varied. <laughs> but but uh, I have to say that, um, you know, Harper's done a lot of damage, so the parks people were also incredibly overworked, so it was kind of top-down project. And so you land there as an artist, and you're like, hi, and they're just like, more work is all they see. <laughs> <laughs> but on the but in the end, uh, I, I made some very good um, connections, and then I tried to find out more about uh, the situation with the Ukulit mm -hmm. and uh, peoples, and uh, 
Tadokwat. And that was difficult. That was difficult because I think people didn't want to say anything because it was uh, not, not necessarily um, per se between the nations, but also just the, inc the politics are so intense and they're ongoing. And then also the layers of history, uh, and then a military history and Cold War history. And one point, I, I was do I did a lot of archival research, and a lot of research in general, which doesn't you know I always do that for my work, and it it's not literally in the work, but it it uh, informs the work, and it also um, just informs me in the sense that I think partly why I make art is to to keep learning and to find out what I'm trying to find out. So I, I find that an integral part of my practice, even though it's not instrumentalized and manifest in the work. But at times it was difficult and people were um, a little wary about opening up uh, some of those things about the park. It's not that they're necessarily actively trying to not disclose because you know they have signage, but yet it's kind of on a level of, uh, it's not, it's not, it doesn't, it's signage that you can kind of say, oh, there's the Kapyong Memorial, and then there's this predictable, uh, ugly concrete plaque. Um, and uh, just because uh, even getting up there was really hard because there were potholes and they just paved it for 150. Um, and, uh, just, um, you know, people kind of have signage about Cold War runes, but it's it's kind of like cut off cerebrally. There's no kind of affective relationship with the intense Pacific Rim histories when you think of, um, uh, you know, uh, mid-20th century history and how incredibly entangled it is. And also uh, with um, uh, the fact that there are, Literally, there are uh, active, ongoing uh, land uh, uh, struggles going on within the park that are continual. So it's, it's just very sanitized, really. It's just all very sanitized. It's kind of, here it is on a certain superficial level, we'll give you this information, but how does it, I mean, when you really let it into your consciousness and you kind of think about uh, the layers of um, injustice, really, and, and also in terms of historical trauma and c continuing uh, uh, relations that need to be uh, rectified, it, it, that, that's not, that's not uh, at all visible on site and so how do you presence that rather than represent it because I didn't feel I can just go there and say you know and 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 a very um for me also in terms of meeting with First Nations um elders and youth that my sister helped facilitate it was uh, a very um kind of it was it was one that was trying to be bureaucratically managed mm. and um, we weren't allowed to do certain things. So that was difficult. And so we weren't even allowed to kind of uh, go beyond what was sanctioned. So in terms of contacts, it had to be legitimated sort of through the project, through Parks Canada. And that was very difficult for us because we don't operate that way. But yet um, in the end, uh, I think we met people and then they realized that uh, we were incredibly sincere and they met my family and I think there was just a kind of um, opening up and in fact I did a uh, just a closed event um, with the elders and uh, my family my parents and really uh, and, and and the the youth and my children and my nieces and my other family and it was probably the heart of the piece that was just a private ceremony to honor what I'd heard. And I'd never done anything like that. And I have to say, um, yeah, I mean, I, I didn't want to represent that. And it's, there's some images, bad cell phone images on the, on the site. 
Um, but I didn't want to, I'm not even really sure how to really think about it yet. It's something I'm working through, but it was a, a great honor to, to really understand what that means, like firsthand, not just read about it, mm -hmm. but to, to listen to what people had to say and um, really take that into my body uh, about the site and what the land means. And it's complicated. It's not just cart you know, colonial cartography here is because they're, they're shifting territories and use and, and relations and also place names and things like that that aren't recognized and also the struggle to maintain that knowledge when they're also speakers of those languages, um, uh, fluent speakers are, are uh, diminishing, you know, through the realities of... Um, dispersion and colonization and, and the fact that the new channels are, were only formulated in 73, right? So anyway, I could go on, but the site is very, uh, it, it, it concretizes the specificities of what we're talking about rather than abstractions. And also to be on the land, on the foreshore, to see the ocean, it's, it's so, uh, so, uh, uh, extraordinary in terms of the force of what that is in terms of the how how little I am <laughs> how tiny my life is and how short our, our actual mortal lives are um, I think that there was something you said um, that actually it also really reminded me of Tanya's practice but um, was you talked about uh, in your introduction to your work you talked about hauntings and uh, when I was thinking about forms of citation or other forms of maybe uh, acknowledging presence or acknowledging uh, the sort of uh, the totality of what forms what a place is, um, there's a lot that we can't necessarily see or we can't necessarily speak to, but that you, you re really is present. And I felt that in the video, oh. that I felt that I was, you know, without maybe even necessarily getting to name it, I felt like I was also maybe in a similar process that you were in of um, just feeling through what some of those layers of, of, the, of the different uh, kind of enter, different qualitative presences were. And even looking at your, um, you know, I can tell they're your children and that they're your parents and also getting a sense of that, that type of relativity uh, between the family and the duration and time and this intergenerational experience, but also that there was a sense of something that was, you know, you're not physically in it until the very end, but that there's a sense of the presence of that that you're feeling through watching how other people are experiencing that. And so I thought that, for myself anyway, there was, I, f I, I know haunting is a, is a big thing for you, but I think to, in terms of trying to get at specters of time or specters of relations or specters of, of um, knowledge that are, are maybe unspeakable or hard to put into words. So I don't know if I'll talk about that. Yeah, I think one thing, it was quite interesting when we first screened the films in Mississauga, was my, I think my first uh, time seeing all of the final works. And it was interesting to me that um, there were sort of similar strategies of, of dispersing and scattering in, in kind of, um, um, blurring in, in both of their uh, video works. And yeah, it, it, to me it does speak to like the, the project, uh, there's so many stories in the project and there's so many families and experiences and lands and, and uh, it becomes quite impossible to represent all of that. Or for example, to, to like deliver a funding deliverable of like, you know, where people are having a dialogue where everybody's represented, like that just doesn't happen. And, and yet there's something in the strategies you, you use uh, in those works that is really evocative of, of much, um, much that we could, uh, un un maybe uncovering is not the right word, but much, there's, there's so many layers, right? Which is very evident in the kind of action of kind of archeological or digging uh, action in the film. but. Um, I don't know what the question was anymore, but I was going to say this. I was going to say that uh, I think for me, what's really interesting in this reflection and thinking about everyone's process too is that 
uh, and this, uh, maybe this idea of citation or just site-specific work, is that I think of all the sites quite differently now. I had a chance very recently to go to um, Pacific Rim National Park, uh, Jin Miyoon, and so I've now seen your film now after the experience of being in that landscape and actually meeting Elder um, Joe Martin and, uh, and, and seeing the work uh, in the gift shop in the park and yeah. picking um, high bush uh, wild blueberries at the, um, mm -hmm. at the memorial on Radar Hill, mm -hmm. which you're not supposed to do, but anyway. Uh, <laughs> I was like, those are high bush blueberries. And we picked some low bush blueberries in, uh, in Old Crow. Uh, and and it's, those, <laughs> it's those stories for me that are not, like, like you're saying, they're present. Um, but they're not necessarily um, articulated, each of those stories, right? Or family histories or interconnected um, relationships of governance that we have within our communities. And so uh, there was something really beautiful in, in how much those moments of, um, of not focusing on an objective representation of the landscape kind of gave. I, I think it's more about presencing, you know, like the social material and historical relations. And I think... When I was watching your film, Janine, um, I was struck by how the objects were, uh, the focus on the objects. Well, first, that aerial view of the trees being so alive, like the landscape literally, it's not even about landscape, it's like it is alive, like those trees are alive, everything's alive, everything is alive. And um, the objects that you focus on, they're, they're verbs. They're not nouns, they're verbing, you know. And, and I felt so much of actually what you were trying to, to give a spatial, not, it's, it's, it's a relational thing. It's like, and for me, it's, 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 it's my family, but it's because I myself in relation, and it's diminished in a lot of um, cultural contexts where the individual reigns supreme as if you're a bounded individual. I don't believe in that world. I actually am interested in the things between things, you know, and, and how they become verbs and they, they're alive, like literally. And I feel that when I'm in the presence of um, being, when you, I'm at the ocean or when I'm looking closely uh, and when I'm... Uh, yeah, just just uh, some of the things that I learned from the elders and just listening to the stories and and the veterans really touched me too. And so it's, you know, it's the things between things and I'm trying to get at the relation where one thing transforms into another without becoming a static representation because I think that's the problem with self and othering with any kind of philosophical system which with which ossifies things and then you can separate them. You can do a lot of damage to things when you can separate, but you can't if it's all a part of you, you know? And I sense that very much um, um, in, in the works, in your work, definitely. And uh, anyway, I felt it was an honor. I actually learned so much from doing this project. Uh, and I want to, I, I, it set me on an, uh, another kind of path both formally and in my life. And uh, I'm very grateful for that experience. Does anybody in the audience want to ask a question? We have some two people with, oh, Cheyenne. <laughs> yeah, you do. Uh, <laughs> thanks for organizing this conversation, Amy, where the projects could uh, articulate themselves on their own terms. And I kind of want to flip that back to the institutions that have been a part of this. And I think this relates to 1993. So uh, what has an engagement with this project and its core concern with problematizing confederation and confederation's role as a symbol or solidification of the colonial project uh, done to the structures or systems of the institutions that, has, that this project has taken as its partners? So in other words, uh, how are these institutions changed? And I'm thinking of the, all of the schools that were part of this, or Partners in Art, or Parks Canada, or all of these things. So I'm wondering, yeah, what have they taken from this? Uh, 
you know, you can be the institution. Huh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> like I'm going to go out there and ask one of you City of Vancouver people next, so just wait for it, okay? You're, you're not in the dark. Jeez. I can see you. <laughs> I don't know what it really changed within the institution, but I think as a uh, learning and teaching experience, it while it changed individually, it changed everybody's relation to the park. But what we also, what was really important in our course is to challenge and to see and to question the role of art. Like, why do we make public art? Who is the public? Who is the audience? What are the crucial questions to be also in such a, uh, uh, that was a little bit different than, than, than being in a national park, in this very dense, very contested urban uh, situation within Vancouver, where there is right now there's the mural festival going on and things like that, and there's the Vancouver Biennial. Those are the things we also had to deal with, and I thought we made actually a quite good counterpoint to some of those things. So, um, but I also think, I mean, all the discussions we had with, with Park Sport uh, uh, and with all the people involved, I think everybody learned from each other. I think it was also, I don't know, Marie and Sheila here. So. Yeah. So, who has a. Oh, sorry. Yeah, so in the class, and just sort of building off what Jin Mi was saying, like, I think of the park very differently now. I think I always will, um, especially the social cultural factors. And institutionally, I found in this course, we started with like de-learning what we thought of the park and really deconstructing what was going on, especially for me, like the descendant of European settlers, I have a very different history to it. And just recontextualizing the park for me and being there in person was super important and different than most courses I've taken. Um, and in the brochure, there's a photo of me like as a child in the tree. <laughs> and so considering that to now and just like that I was a part of that photographic importance of the tree being photographed and just to sort of share a story, being in the site and studying for it, people and like busloads of people would come in front of the tree. They'd take a photo for like 10 seconds and then drive off and just like bunches of people did that. So... Being in the classroom, we would have thought of it very differently and talked about super theoretically, but then being there and considering the context, we could see what's actually happening and how people are really interacting with these, with these sites and histories. Does, um, oh, do you want to say something? Yes. Um, I just, I had a few conversations with you, Sabina, after. Um, I think one of the biggest highlights for us was traveling to Euculet and getting to meet um, Joe, who is this amazing, knowledgeable um, man who actually has the knowledge how to traditionally carve canoes in the woods. So he goes out and he finds a tree and he spends a lot of time in the area and then um, takes the tree from the woods rather than getting a log harvested somewhere else and delivered. And they carve that log over a two-week period in the woods before it's hollowed out and they carry that out. So um, one of the conversations that we had from that experience is that it would be amazing to have that opportunity to learn that, to not um, study things in a theoretical way, but to be really enriched in the landscape and to help preserve some of that knowledge. Because um, I've been thirsty for it my whole life, and it's really difficult to live a double day where you're raising children putting food on the table and preserving um, this traditional knowledge. And it's not something that you can come to and learn in an institution like this. And my first year class, I was asked why I was here. Well, it has a lot to do with social equity in the world that we live out out there. So I find creative ways to take what I learn in here, mix it um, in ways to culturally preserve our way of life. Um, so I think that there's been a lot of valuable things that have come from it. And I think that we've been able to firsthand experience how valuable that traditional knowledge is, how someone walking in the woods every day knows how that hollow tree happened from when that widowmaker fell and how its branches need to turn. And that's all from observation, not something you're learning in a classroom. So I just wanted to share that. And that's uh, locally at Elder, Joe Martin, who you mentioned earlier, just mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. cite. Um, elder. Uh, but I just want to say uh, from a curatorial perspective and going into the project and kind of having a different maybe view 
we made like a drone view of everything, <laughs> um, is that I don't, I, I don't, I didn't set out to change any institution. Like the institution needs to do that work, obviously. Um, so, uh, but I do think that idea of relationality um, has been really important and it, it's quite subtle. Um, the kinds of narratives and stories and experiences and how um, I've seen things kind of shift uh, throughout that. Um, certainly, uh, like when we talk about levels of responsibility or um, accountability or continuing this work or not, you know, what's uh, next year, you know, what, what National Park commissioned artists are gonna work next year. I mean, we certainly wanted to see a legacy. I think we should all be demanding a space for artists in, in parks, like that's, it was quite a foreign thing for them to work with artists and to cite work and yet it's so evocative, we learn so much, publics really responded to it and engaged with it. I think that we need a space there and I think that um, Stanley Park and the work the city is doing, I do have to do a citation that some of my first um, work in Stanley Park after the windstorm as an artist was fundamental to kind of approaching uh, the concepts I'm working with both as an artist and curator and so um, some of that work is, is importantly kind of happening, but uh, it is, you know, in your experience that you're kind of talking about this transformative um, or different perspective you have uh, as now attached to the land. And um, that's what sort of, uh, it's those stories to me that are important uh, in terms of the way they're continuing and functioning and, um, you know, but certainly I would like to see us all advocate uh, for this kind of legacy, both in the classroom and in the parks uh, system. I think it's really important. Um, I just want to mention Vi and Bob Monday that we met at the Quisitis Center as well. And I think that's where the postcards are and at CU Kulit um, Cultural Center. And I think that's a really terrific question that you're asking because um, when I think about, uh, you know, there's talk uh, and at the university, actually um, Roxanne and uh, Crystal and I are going to... Um, Next, a couple of Mondays from now, uh, there's a, a session on the uh, equity myth, um, a book that's come out, uh, I think, out of UBC Press, um, about uh, racialization in Indigenous um, faculty, actually. And, and it's, it's, it's a, a struggle. Uh, and it, it's got to be spoken, and I think for me what, what's important in terms of this institutionalization, especially in terms of indigeneity, is that, you know, you don't just ask someone to come into an institution and tokenize them and say, now fix it, and then you're probably the only one, and you're doing all this work and you expect to do the work all over the place. Uh, I think that it's important that we go to that knowledge, that we don't just have a chair in Indigenous studies or, or Indigenous art, and then, you know, there you go, take care of that problem for us. It's like, no, we move towards that, and the whole curricular situation has to change, the power relations have to change. There's a whole ep epistemic and ontological relationship to the way we think about relationality that needs to shift, and that's a massive shift that needs to happen. So that's a challenge, and, and I think um, we can say that we can all be up to the challenge and do it in a way that's respectful and forward, moving towards um, a way that is, uh, is, is, is good for all of us. It's not just about a kind of punitive thing that we've got to kind of now rectify in a Puritan way. I feel so enriched by the fact that I've been able to... Um, try to even get an inkling, and I don't have really any sense of it at all, what, a, what, what it might be to live in, within nature where everything is related to everything else. I don't have a clue, and I don't think um, the way that uh, certain kinds of philosophical systems that have been prioritized uh, are amenable to that way of thinking and being and knowledge uh, being shared and created, and 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 uh, more equity, and and uh, uh, you know, uh, it's 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 not it's certainly isn't it's not really you know amenable to the kind of extractive late capitalist thinking that we're embedded in it in a neoliberal 
university and in neoliberal institutions and in the arts. So, you know, we've got a lot of work to do, but I think that's a terrific question because I don't think I, we can talk a lot about all this on a certain level, but there's work to be done. And I think um, it should be work done by everybody, not certain bodies that are marked uh, by history. Um, so, so I hope that all of you will work towards that. And I don't mean that in any kind of preachy way. I'm trying to work towards that and I'm not saying that I, you know, I'm, I have privilege that I need to also uh, uh, include myself. So I don't, I don't mean to, to sound like I'm on a high horse. Yeah, I mean, to just speak to something Cheyenne said, I mean, Partners in Art, who basically formulated this project, is based out of Toronto, and they're not here. So <laughs> there's like a major institutional partner in this that cannot be asked. But um, in many of the, 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 the parks and the institution apparatuses that run them also aren't here. But I don't know, I'm, it was a sin it's sincere. Does anybody from the Parks Board here want to say something to this? Because I think it's really important, actually. And I would love to hear some of what that was like for you guys. If someone wants to run a mic to, is there? I'll bring it over. <laughs> is it there? <laughs> okay, I thought you meant literally us. Uh, someone put your hand, Marie, or? I'll get to work. I'll be changing, changing things so to get some budgets. <laughs> it's like. Hi. Um, oh, sorry, I didn't see it. Oh, it's Jill. <laughs> oh, it's Jill. <laughs> um, so I just got to talk quickly because my parking has run out and it's some new electronic thing and the guy on the phone couldn't extend it. And... Don't you work for the city? Can't you do something about that? <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. So actually, I don't anymore. Exactly. I'm an independent now. Um, so... Yeah, um, Marie and I work with the Park Board and, and uh, work with this project. And I think uh, for, for people inside the institution are, are um, as Jimmy said, you know, we're working uh, to try and make change there. And it's a complicated change. And the layers of uh, colonization and government and and imposed relations are complex and it's like a great big barge. And, and sometimes we feel like we're these tugs, these little tugs, you know, that are kind of pushing at this end and, you know, pulling at that end. Um, the project that Tanya talked about, the, the um, Stanley Park Environmental Art, and Tanya and Cease were, were both part of that project. And uh, Kamala Todd was helped us with the selection of the artist process. So there's, I think within Park Board, uh, within, within the cultural sector, there's um, been work, but it's the beginning of work. Um, we we uh, had some reconciliation strategies adopted. Um, we've created an, now this is the complex thing. I think this is a really complex thing in, and the projects working with Sabine were not the, the first ones. Uh, the Park Board has created a formal relationship with the governments of the three nations, the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil and, and we have a working policy that there will not be artwork, new artwork, put in Stanley Park, unless it's something that uh, has sprung from or is created in agreement with the three nations. And we have monthly meetings. Uh, so we're talking, and we're talking beyond our court, we're talking about what that park is gonna be. Mm -hmm. So like the 100 year, 100 year vision for that park is being talked about with, at a round table with the nations um, and the park board sitting together. So it's, you know, uh, the Park Board is a democratically elected government, which Churchill said democracies is, is horrible, but it's, you know, the, word, the best form of government. Well, maybe it's not, because, you know, the elected governments of the three nations, that, that again, is an imposed form of government, but it, 
It's the government that the park board, as a democratic government, has to start with that working with those people. So the complexity of that, I mean, we all know the complexity of artists' um, desire to create work and running into governments and bureaucracies. Um, I worked for 10 years with the Association for Non-Commercial Culture, and it was very much about um, putting things in places that weren't sanctioned places for artwork. So when you, in an attempt to have a new form of relationship about what's going to happen in Stanley Park, but when that relationship needs to start with elected governments, then that role, that role of elders, that role of relationship, which is complex within each nation, and then the role of artists in relation to government, like these, so it takes a lot of time uh, to get there, and, and we didn't have the time we needed within this. Um, we are creating a place with the three nations uh, for artwork that comes from those nations in Stanley Park. I don't know how much of that is public yet. Um, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna blow it. Yeah, the A-frame <laughs> is going to be an artist residency space uh, where the artists who are working there are being determined with um, an arts and cultural Her heritage committee that's made up of the three nations. Uh, and there will be a, a project beginning um, early next year. And the selection of the artists, the, how that's even going to happen is, is going to be determined by the nations. So every step, every question, every challenge, every time, it helps move you know, and change the direction of things. Um, so yeah. Thanks to everyone. And sometimes when you come to us, it is a bit like, oh, fuck, how am I going to do that? <laughs> I've got so much. But, you know, it was important, and we really enjoyed uh, working. We really enjoyed the opportunity. And, yeah. Thanks, Thanks, Jill. I work. appreciate that. Um, I am going to, I've, I've made, I am remiss. I apologize for having maybe taken a bit long before people from the audience got to ask questions but it was, we were in something here. So I am actually gonna close this session now. We're a bit 15 minutes over, but we, are, we have a reception set up in the lobby and we would love for you to join us. And um, I'm, I'm sure all of you are going to go downstairs and there'll be lots of opportunity if you wanna ask people specific questions or otherwise. And the other thing um, I will say that to re reiterate what Sophie said is the brochures for the Laboratory Landscapes projects are, um, as you're gonna exit, uh, they're on the, the counters of the, on either side. And Jinmi, where did you put your postcards? Right here, but I can bring them to the uh, reception. Okay, Jinmi's gonna bring her postcards down to the reception if anybody wants one. And I also, if anyone's a little bit confused still about the full extent to what Landmarks is, partially I didn't wanna give too much background because they have a very thorough website. Um, that has a huge amount of information on all the artists, all the locations, all the projects. You can watch the videos, you can look at the curriculum, et cetera. So I do encourage you to go seek that out if you want to find out more than what we've already talked about. And thank you, all thank of you, you guys. Thank you.